In today's lecture, we're going to be talking about Aspergillus, a genus of fungus which is ubiquitous in the environment and is primarily associated with disease of the respiratory tract. Aspergillus are rapidly growing septate fungi. When we grow them in the lab, they produce pigmented colonies, which are sort of blue to gray. Um, microscopically, their conidiophores are unbranched, which is really helpful in differentiating them from penicillium species, which can be quite similar grossly. So in these images on the right, what you can see, uh, the left picture is a penicillium mold, and you can see these branched conidiophores. They almost look like fingers from which the spores come off of. On the right, we have an aspergillus, and we have an unbranched conidiophore. So there's sort of one large structure, almost looks like a dandelion. The spores of aspergillus are very small, two to three microns, and this is small enough that they're able to reach the end of the bronchial tree. So make their way down into the uh, bottoms of the lungs. In these images here, you can see various organisms within the aspergillus fumigatus complex. We have fumigatus, Lentulus, uh, another genus, and Aspergillus felis. Um, all of these are united by this unbranched conidiophore. So this is really a defining structure uh, of this genus. In this image here, you can see some white Aspergillus-like colonies. They weren't actually identified as Aspergillus, um, growing on rose bengal agar. And rose bengal, as you can see from this picture, is a pink dye, which inhibits the growth of bacteria, allowing us to selectively culture fungi. Um, interestingly, these colonies were grown from a moldy yam that I had in my kitchen. So aspergillus is ubiquitous. It's in soil. It's in decomposing matter. Uh, Aspergillus fumigatus is commonly found in overheated or spoiled hay, and this may be how some of our agricultural animals become exposed. Infections with this uh, fungus are typically uh, sporadic and uncommon, so it's not something that we tend to see in large groups of animals. It oftentimes is more reflective of individual susceptibility to the organism and perhaps immunosuppression. The exception to this is in uh, poultry production, where we can see outbreaks of aspergillosis. Aspergillus does most commonly involve the respiratory tract, whether this is a true infection or a hypersensitivity. Um, so we see hypersensitivity to mold much more commonly in people. There's much better evidence for it, but this may be a similar uh, pathological process that we see uh, with exacerbation of asthma or heaves in horses. Aspergillus species, so a variety of organisms within this genus, Fumigatus, Terius, or Deflectus, are associated with a variety of pathogens in animals. So in cattle, we see most commonly mycotic abortion, but also mastitis. In horses, Aspergillus is associated with guttural pouch mycosis. In dogs, we see nasal infection, so nasal aspergillosis. In a wide variety of avian species, we see uh, air sacculitis and pneumonia, um, brooder pneumonia in our uh, domestic poultry species. And in people, it's primarily associated with respiratory tract infections, although systemic disease is recognized in those who are severely immunosuppressed. We're going to start off our discussion with birds. Um, brooder pneumonia is seen most commonly in young chickens, and it's seen in chicks that are exposed to a large number of spores. So it's sort of associated with dirty environments, a high environmental load, and we can actually see outbreaks involving multiple animals. Grossly, what we see are nodules in the lungs and air sacs, so these sort of foci of granulomatous inflammation. And because it is associated with dirty environments, good hygiene in the barn is key. In mature birds, we see aspergillosis um, due to the inhalation of spore-laden dust and the associated respiratory tract signs, so dyspnea and potentially emaciation with more chronic infections. Again, nodules are going to be seen in the lungs. Interestingly, for anyone who goes on to work in zoological uh, medicine, uh, we know that penguins are actually particularly susceptible to aspergillus infections. Aspergillosis is seen in many birds, our domestic, wildlife, 
um, and exotic species, and the presentation is quite variable from individually infected animals to large outbreaks um, in affected flocks. In these images here, um, you can see some tissues from a swan with aspergillosis. On the left, we have granulomatous air sacculitis. So the air sacs are these structures associated with the lungs, which enhance the efficiency of, of respiration. And what you can appreciate here are all of these nodules over this tissue. And in some regions, I think we can even appreciate uh, mycelium. So there's sort of these fuzzy mold-like colonies uh, growing on the, the mucosa. And then on the right, we have a lung uh, from another affected swan with nodules associated with aspergillus. These two images here are both of lungs. On the left, we have lungs from a duck. On the right, we have lungs from an emu. In both, we can see uh, these granulomatous sort of caseating lesions uh, throughout the lung tissue, all associated with aspergillus. And then finally on the left, you can see an image of a duck with air sacculitis caused by aspergillus. And I think what you can appreciate here is that we have this fuzzy mold all over the air sac. So the bird is almost like a, a fungal puff ball when it's opened up. On the right, we have histological examination um, of tissues from a pheasant-like bird. And I think you can see a lot of fungal elements in this microscopic uh, image. Um, including many of these unbranched uh, conidia fours. In horses, aspergillus is associated with guttural pouch mycoses, most commonly aspergillus fumigatus. We don't have a good appreciation of what exactly predisposes a horse to develop these infections. Guttural pouch mycosis is oftentimes a unilateral disease, and clinical signs can include epistaxis, so nosebleeds, dysphagia, laryngeal hemiplasia, facial nerve dysfunction, or Horner's syndrome, so all neurological deficiencies associated with an infection in the region of these cranial nerves within the guttural pouch. These animals are typically afebrile, so they're not uh, systemically sick, although as the fungus invades neural or vascular tissues, we can see signs associated with that and potentially very, very rapid death. Um, anyone who's working with horses should review their anatomy of the guttural pouch. There's some very important structures beyond nerves, things like the carotid artery, which runs through the guttural pouch and can be eroded and ultimately rupture uh, as a result of aspergillus infections. Guttural pouch mycosis is diagnosed based on clinical signs and also endoscopic evaluation. In these images here, um, you can see the endoscopic view of a horse's guttural pouch affected uh, with aspergillus. In the left here, uh, noted by this triangle or arrowhead, you can see the internal carotid artery, so very big blood vessel. And then on the right, I think you can appreciate this large sort of white mycelial mat, this fuzzy aspergillus colony uh, growing within uh, the guttural pouch. The case fatality rate for guttural pouch mycoses is quite high, so approximately a third. And the prognosis is very, very poor without treatment. These infections are managed by first debriding the lesions, so physically removing as much of that abnormal tissue and fungal growth as possible, followed by topical uh, antifungal therapy, uh, most commonly enoconazole or myconazole. Because aspergillus likes to invade vascular structures, um, iatrogenic thrombosis and embolization of that carotid artery can be really, really important. It can prevent both bleeding following debridement and also uh, deprive the fungal colony of nutrients. Parenteral antifungals are of questionable value, so for guttural pouch mycoses, it's all about local treatment. <music> <music>